so what I, I would just like to introduce you to uh, these two ladies who are, are lovely. Um, you may you may recognise certainly probably Jane and possibly Maggie's face. Um, not from Crime Watch, no, but from uh, a video they were on before. So Maggie, sorry, Jane went through Thrive with. Uh, Sorry, with Ali, uh, very successfully, obviously, because I wouldn't be bringing a failed client to, to conference. And uh, Jane was the lady that I bet I said that you know if you if you get over your metaphobia and your terrible fear of eating in front of people, like that, uh, I'll take you out for a nice meal, um, expecting them not to. <laughs> and so we had a meal out in Nottingham uh, a few months back, and she did a video and she did one of the radio talks and this kind of stuff. She's in what magazine? <coughs> Take a break. Take a break. Um, yeah. Absolutely lovely. What is particularly interesting um, about Jane is that uh, Maggie also had some couple of thrive sessions. I went to all of Jane's sessions with her. Maggie went to all of Jane's sessions with her. And Maggie uh, was uh, a significant other in terms of psychologically speaking and the collusive other and this kind of stuff. And the, the changing dynamic within the relationship, and still now, Jane's completely over mento, but Maggie still finds herself having to resist her want and need to collude and be the significant other still. So apart from just getting them down here to have another drink with them, and uh, I thought just, if you give them a big round of applause, they just talk a little bit about their experiences together going through that programme. So uh, Maggie and Jane. Thank you. Sort of have it about there. Can you do that and then pass it over? Don't let her keep holding because you know. Oh, no. yeah. <laughs> she talks a lot. <laughs> um, I'd just like to tell you a bit about my life before I went to Alison and after. Um, the first time I realised I got a problem, I was about nine and I was in a car with my mum and dad going on holiday. And my mum was in the back and very pregnant and she was sick down my neck. I can remember ripping all my clothes off and even obviously though the clothes were washed and dry cleaned, I would never touch the clothes again. They were just put in the back of the wardrobe and that was it. And after that, every time somebody said they felt ill, I would walk away making an excuse I was tired or I got to go to the toilet or something so that people didn't know the real reason why I was walking away. Um, I did get married and have two children. If they were ill, I used to lock them in the bathroom and I had sent for the father home or run around next door and fetch my friend to look after them because I just could not look after them. When I was a teenager, I couldn't go out with friends because friends get drunk and then they're ill. So the few times I did go out, if anybody started getting drunk, I just say I was tired and go home. Holidays are a nightmare. Um, aeroplanes in particular, because you can't jump out of an aeroplane, obviously. <laughs> um, I used to have to go to the doctors and get diazepam and take enough to send me to sleep till we got there. So obviously the next day of the holiday was ruined. And then three or four days before we were coming back, I'd start panicking about flying again. And more diets of hand. So it really wasn't worth going on holiday because I'd have about two days where I wasn't worried about flying. Um, I learned to drive at 17, so I didn't have to use public transport because obviously people can take ill on coaches and trains and whatever, so I was driving and got my own car at 17. Um, I did used to go in other people's car, cars if I thought I could trust the people who I was travelling with. There was a very small minority of my friends who did know about my problem, but I should say 95% of them didn't because it's just something you don't tell people. Um, 
obviously most of my family knew, but not a lot of them understood. Um, my mother certainly didn't. She just used to say, oh, don't be so stupid, you know, and don't know what's the matter with you and stuff like that. Um, one time travelling on the motorway, somebody in the back of the car um, said they were going to be sick. So going at 70 miles an hour, I literally opened the car door and was just about to jump when the driver dragged me back. But I would rather have jumped on the busy motorway than had anybody be sick in the car. Um, I wouldn't go to hospital under any circumstances. It was too much of a trauma to go to hospital. Even when I was really ill, I wouldn't go in hospital. I'd stay at home, because again, you'd rather die than go somewhere where you could see people being sick. Um, when I was about 50, I did go for some CBT therapy, which made it a lot worse. Um, because he just used to put sick bowls and play noises and things like that at me. And I only went two or three times because it made me think about it all the time. And if I thought about one incident that I'd had a near miss or it happened, every other incident, going right back to my childhood, would come into my head. And it could stay there for days, so you were just like going crazy, thinking about all the near misses you'd had, or times when you'd had to run away, or times when I'd even got nasty because I couldn't get away. So <coughs> life was, I wasn't living, I was just existing around this phobia that I had got. Um, then I found Alison. A friend of mine told me about Thrive. Went on the internet, found Alison. I still didn't really see how a book in Alison could get me over my phobia because I thought it was something that was just me. I've got to live with it. I'd lived with it for 50 odd years. You know, nobody could change me now. It was part of my personality. But Maggie insisted that I went. I think she was a bit sick of it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so <coughs> went on to see Alison, not knowing what to expect. I thought, if there's a sick ball on the table, I'm turning around and going. But obviously there wasn't. I explained to Alison, because I can't even stand the word. If I was reading a book and the word was there, I couldn't even stand the word. So I explained to Alison that I didn't want any noises playing to me by tape or anything like that. And she said, no, it was nothing like that. I felt very relaxed with Alison. She was really nice, really understood, really supportive. And after two or three sessions, I actually looked forward to going to see Alison because I knew, even then, that I was going to do it. And I did. I think that uh, was it eight sessions, Alison, something like that. And now I've been on an aeroplane twice. No tablets. Love the fly. I've just come back off a cruise to Norway where there were sick bags everywhere. Because everybody, I think everybody on the ship was ill except me, including my game. And loved it. I went to hospital last week um, for a scan, walked into the room, full of sick balls. I came out laughing and said to Maggie, she's got about 30 sick balls in there, I wonder what she needs all those for. <laughs> you wouldn't have got me in that room before. You just would not have got me in that room. And we even went for a coffee in the hospital cafe. That would never have happened before because there's ill people in the cafe, so that wouldn't have happened. And Alison and Thrive have just totally changed my life. 
I wouldn't eat out in restaurants before. And if I did, it had to be immaculately clean and I, and I had to know it was. And I would be scamming the whole time I was in there just to make sure there was no drug marks. And if there was, I'd just leave my mail and go. I couldn't sit near the toilets because if anybody was going to be ill, they'd be running to the toilet. So it was even really awkward to go for a meal. <clears throat> Believe it or not, TV was the other big thing. I could only watch quiz programmes because you'd be surprised how many programmes have got people being sick in. If you've never noticed, no, <laughs> because nearly every programme's got somebody being sick in, except quiz shows. So, when I was on my own, it was quiz shows all the time. And it's just become a way of life. But now, I can watch anything on TV, go out for meals, go to the pub, absolutely do anything. All thanks to Fry and Alison. I'm now living, not just existing. I'll hand you over to Maggie now to tell you what it was like to be in the Maggie, Maggie, hold on one second. Jane, just. Yeah. So, I, just I, I heard that right. You're on the cruise yeah. and, and people being sick all over the place. All over, because it was really rough. We went up to the Arctic Circle and everybody was being sick and there were sick bags posted everywhere. And how did you feel about that? Fine. Just not at all, not bothered not at all? Not bothered at all. There wasn't little bits there, little bits of anxiety, little worries, regrets um, about booking a... Oh no, no regrets at all. <coughs> I, I did get a bit upset when Maggie took it, but that wasn't, I don't think, because of being sick. I think it was because I was virtually left on my own, so... <laughs> 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 I went for a meal one night, I was the only one in the restaurant, everybody else <laughs> control where I was sick and I could actually stop myself being sick um, but it was mainly other people because I couldn't control that. Thanks. Just to tell you a little bit about the cruise, um, about four years ago we cruised to the Caribbean and it was our first cruise. And we went, as we went through the Bay of Biscay, which is notorious, I was very seasick. Um, and we were cruising in November, and we had a balcony cabin. And I was ill for three days. And Jane spent three days in November at sea on the balcony. <laughs> Even though I knew that I would not actually vomit, just the fact that I felt sick was enough to keep her in the balcony. And at one point, her saying, I'm jumping over, I can't cope. And it's not an idle threat. I knew there was every possibility that unless I could show that I wasn't going to be sick, that she would jump. And I think it's really difficult for people to understand the depth of fear that people have when they have a phobia. I was the driver in the car when she tried to get out at 70 miles an hour. And that was really difficult because I got to hold her because she would have gone. But what she didn't tell you is that we then sat on the hard shoulder for about three hours in the middle of nowhere at night on the M1 with two children, one who was feeling quite ill, trying to convince her to get back into the car. She talked about restaurants. We used to go to a lovely Italian, and we used to go quite regularly, probably about every six weeks. And then somebody was ill one night when we were there. We've never been since. That was 11 years ago. And it's just an absolute no. And if somebody had been sick, 
if they've been a, a, somebody comes to the house and been ill and been sick, they would never come back and wouldn't be allowed. And she mentioned briefly about she could be quite nasty, she could be vile, <laughs> absolutely vile. I've known Jane for about 30 years and um, I've known all of the family for that, that length of time. And when Jane's husband was ill, I moved in to help care for him. Um, and Ted had cancer, he had lung cancer. And he used to cough. And he used to cough and make that sound that people make when they're going to be sick. I've had to physically restrain Jane from hitting him. And every foul, dirty name that she could think of, she called it. And that was her fear. We she used the C word on him. She used words that I've never heard. <laughs> never heard. And we had to, Ted had to go and stay with his son um, for the end of his life. And when he was admitted to hospital, Jane never went to see him until he was in intensive care. Because her thought process was, he can't be sick if he's unconscious. They won't be sick in intensive care. Didn't tell me it could be anything to that. <laughs> so she did spend the last days of Ted's life with him, but Ted was unconscious. So for 27 years of their marriage, where they'd been very close, they lost that because of the phobia. When Ted died, I stayed. I'd been there that long that I didn't move out. Um, so I became Jane's enabler, really, but without realising. I'm a nurse by profession, so my role is to care and make people feel better. <coughs> so what I found, what I didn't realise I was doing, was it enabling her quite so much. And she's talked about flying. She says it was a nightmare for her. It was horrendous for me, because it used to start weeks before. Because part of it was all around the control, um, and I'm somebody who likes to be on time, but generally I set up with maybe a 10 minute margin. If I'm going on holiday, I can pack the day before. But all of you will know that for the control, we'd be packing six weeks before. And if I wasn't packed six weeks before, she'd get nasty. When we set off for the journey, she did have the diazepam, but trying to get it into her, was a nightmare because she didn't like the loss of control that she got from the diazepam. She would take it eventually, but would be halfway through the flight before she fell asleep. And all the time she was awake, every time somebody moved, I had to know exactly what they were doing. So I spent my flight, instead of relaxing, reading my book, watching the film, it's just a child getting a packet of crisps. It's somebody opening a toy. They need a wee. They've gone to the toilet. Not that they're going to be sick. And that was the commentary through every flight that we did. When Jane's son moved to Australia and we flew for the first time to Australia, 24 hours of purgatory. <laughs> Absolute purgatory. Um, and booking seats on flights. We can't do last minute flights because we have to be able to book seats and they have to be seats together and Jane has to sit near the window. We have to get on first so that she could scan every person that was coming on and she would know whether or not they were going to be ill within the next eight hours, even if they currently felt quite well. So the commentary would be, I don't like the look of her, where she's sitting. <laughs> and I'd have to follow that person. She's ten rows back, you're fine. And this would go on all the time. Um, at home television, she's talked about the TV. I would have the remote, because quite frankly, quiz shows, when you're watching them every day, and they're quiz shows from the 1970s, it starts to wear a bit thin. So if I wanted to watch something that was a drama, I would have to have the remote. And it would be, you've got the remote, haven't you? Yes, I've got the remote. You're watching, aren't you? If I manage to pick up my iPad or my phone, what are you doing? I'm watching the television. If I wasn't quick enough, I would get the words, because it would be my fault that I'd not turned the TV over in time if somebody had been sick. 
I've not seen the end of so many dramas. I've had to go to work the next day to say, what happened? Because you can't turn it back over. You then back to blankety blank from 1982 or whatever. Um, when we came to see Alison, Jane, I knew that Jane would think that it wasn't going to work. Um, and we were late for the first proper visit. We weren't actually late, we got there on time, but we weren't there half an hour before. And her conversation in the car on the way was, there's no point, may as well just turn around, it's not going to work now, is it? But when we explained to Alison and she understood, it made such a difference. And I went to every session with her, and that made me realise how much I had enabled her to continue with this phobia. And as it had got worse over the years, because we've lived together for 12 years, I probably contributed to that by enabling her quite so much. It's brilliant now, I can't tell you what a difference. It's, it makes me want to cry because it's changed our lives so much. Not just for the silly things like, I've not got to hold the remote 24 hours a day. Strangely, I still do. And I'm the one who, if somebody's going to be sick on telly, I've almost turned it over. And Jane will just laugh now and say, what are you doing? So I'm finding it a little bit harder to get past it. But it's made such a difference. Because Jane's actually a happy person now. Which she wasn't before. She is now. So thank you. Can you just talk us through what, what your thoughts were? 
Um, yes, it was a gradual process because at the beginning, like I said, I didn't think Alison or a book um, could get over this fear I'd had for 50 odd years. I just thought it was part of my makeup, you know, it was almost my personality. It's the way I was. Um, after about the third or fourth session with Alison, um, when she talked about self-esteem, um, we did some quizzes which are in the book, and I didn't realise that my self-esteem was low, really. Um, but it was down at 20%. Um, but near the end of the course, when Alison did it again, it had gone up to 80%. And I think feeling good about myself, which is the way Alison made me feel, um, helped me to overcome the fear, really. Um, it, it was gradual, but after about the fourth session, I knew that I was going to do it, because I was starting to watch a bit of television. And so you're some, avoiding stuff less? Yes, yes, definitely. I was starting to watch TV, and. I wasn't shouting at Maggie to change it over. I probably did still have my t-shirt pulled up over my head or a cushion or something, but it was getting better, slowly but surely. <coughs> and then by about the sixth or seventh session, I just felt wonderful and I could watch television and I could, I'd been to the pub, mm -hmm. I'd been for meals in restaurants. That so every time that you went for a meal, went to the pub, it was more evidence that you were doing this and you were getting there, yeah? Yes, yes. So the whole thing um, was just getting stronger and stronger for you. Yes, that's right, yes. It was just slowly but surely, week by week, um, I was doing more stuff and not thinking about it, not thinking of avoidance techniques because before I always used to have a have an escape route if we were in a restaurant it had to be quite near the front door because I had to have an escape route and that's why I didn't like planes because there was no escape route I have been locked myself in the toilet on a plane before you know and I've sort of come around from the diazepam for the last 10 minutes or whatever um, but I just noticed that things I've been petrified of before weren't there anymore. Can I just add to that? In fact, in the sessions, it was it was Maggie pointing out things that Jane had done without Jane even thinking about it. Yeah, it was. Because it felt so natural for Jane to do those normal things. She wasn't thinking about it, noticing it, and it took Maggie to point out, well, you did this, yeah. we did this this week. Yeah. So it's that, it's that comfortable feeling, just doing things without thinking about it, that starts yeah. to kick in. Yeah. Jane, can I, can I ask you, um, when you look back, was there one or two particular points in the sessions or going through the process that you really made a difference, or one or two things that you really, that really stand out looking back, or was it just a little bit of everything? Um, I think really it was a little bit of everything, but... I didn't have a very good um, childhood. Um, I was adopted as a baby and I frequently got reminded by my adopted parents that what they'd done for me and that they'd take me out the gutter almost and give me a home. So, um, Alison made me feel better about my childhood actually and I think that helped a lot as well. Um, but it was just a slow process. There wasn't one thing that stuck out. Like Alison says, Maggie would often say, oh, well, we went to that restaurant this week and you didn't scan. Because I could never enjoy a meal. All the time I was having a meal, I was, is anybody looking ill? Because I could spot them a mile away. You know, you, you just got this inbred thing where he's going to be sick later on, you know. I don't, I don't know why, that was usually right, wasn't I? So going out for a meal, I never enjoyed because I'd be going around the room like this to make sure everybody was okay. But after four sessions with Alison, I think we went out for a meal, and I didn't realise 
because it had become such a way of life. But Maggie said to me, you didn't scan once. So that was really good. And was that, was that a conscious decision to go out for that meal? Did you think, right, we're getting somewhere with this thriving, thing, let's test it? No? No, not really. Um, we eat out a lot. We, we do eat out a lot, but like I said before, it would have to be in specific restaurants that I knew really well. Up to the immaculately clean, because I've probably been and checked the kitchens. And I had to have this escape room, but we did start trying other places, and that's when I realised that it really didn't matter anymore. Okay. So the absence of the safety seeking and avoidance behaviours, or the lessening of those, yeah. you weren't that aware of it? Not really, no, not until like Alison says Maggie had said, but yes, she did this this week. And I used to be, everything in our house had to be immaculate. Apparently, people have told me now that it used to stink of bleach. I had two six-foot covers filled with every cleaning product you can imagine. And if a new one came out, I had to have it that day. I had to go and fetch it, because it might be better than anything I'd already got. And one of the first things I noticed was that I wasn't cleaning up so much. That was the first thing that came to me was, oh, I haven't bleached and polished everything today, but I don't need to. And that, that was quite a big one for me to, so after 50 odd years of cleaning up every day, and I don't just mean giving a hoover, I mean cleaning up. So that was amazing. I don't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions for me? Yeah, I'd just like to ask, yes. um, at what point did you make find that this might work? Um, I think partly because I am a nurse and um, I've got some mental health background, I know that the talking therapies can be really, really powerful. Um, and when CBT failed, Jane was very much, this is it, I'm, I'm stuck with this now, for life really. Um, but a friend of Jane's had, had a really good therapist and recommended Thrive. And I, I just, you know, what's the worst thing that can happen is nothing will change. So at least give it a try. And I did a lot of research on the internet, first of all, and said that I thought that this, it looked really good. But <clears throat> Jane thought, well, we'll just get the book. And I said, no, you've got to do it with a therapist. Because I, I knew that doing just the book with me would never work, because she would not say to Alison the sort of things she'd say to me. So <laughs> um, that's why we, we did go for the therapist and it, it was amazing. But when I think it started to work was you know, the very first exercise that you do around um, self-esteem and looking for something positive, the 10 positive things. Jane was a, an exceptionally negative person prior to Thrive and struggled. She could not think of one single positive thing. And we used to do... <laughs> we used to do the exercise together and with me prompting her for the positive things and after that first week of doing the positives she was starting to come up with them herself at the end of the week and I knew then that it was going to work because I could already see the change, the difference in her approach one week. in one week. Yeah, so <coughs> I just couldn't think of any at first and I thought mm can't do this exercise, I'll have to go back and tell Alison. And then Maggie says, no, come on, we'll sit down and I'll say things like what you did on Wednesday or something. And I managed to get a couple, but not many did I. And then like, went back to see Alison again and you know how you repeat them and that, but I was repeating if you have got. But after that, I was just able to write loads of stuff. So it really was literally after a couple of weeks, I suppose, that I changed. And learning that your self-esteem is only a couple of weeks old. 
Yeah. Powerful, hugely powerful for people like Did me. Did you believe that? Yes. At first, did you believe no. it? No. I actually, I actually no. think about it, but when I thought about it, well, that makes a lot of sense. Mm. You know, and and it, it is so powerful, because when you've had a, a traumatic past, and you link everything to that past, mm. there's no way you're going to believe a lot of stuff until you recognise that it's all around just the last few weeks. Mm. Huge. You had a point a minute ago, maybe you wanted to say something a minute ago. That was, um, that was the thing about, that's when I first noticed the difference. It was really quick from her not being able to think of a single positive thing to start coming up with her own positive statements. Can I ask Maggie, did your, did your reaction change to Jane? Because obviously, you know, you know the huge support you care deeply for her. Um, so it's understand, understandable that you would be colluding with her phobia over those years. Over that period of therapy, did your reaction start to change? Did, for instance, you know, did you used to say in the past, are you feeling okay? Do we need to worry about this or whatever? Did, did you find that your attitude was changing? Yeah, I, I, I did used to. I, I would be constantly checking her as well as everybody else. Yeah. Um, and I carried on checking, but you made me stop, didn't you? You used to say, just <laughs> stop talking to me about it. <laughs> um, so. Uh, it would be natural was, for you because you're in the habit of doing it. Yeah. So I think I was a bit slower. <laughs> I'm thinking she's been holding you back all these fucks. <laughs> <laughs> You'd have been fine 30 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> You'd have been holding you back. <coughs> Munchausen. Can I just, can I just say, as a, as a side effect though, of me doing the sessions with Jay, um, I was arachnophobic. I'm not anymore. <laughs> and that's purely from uh, helping. Going to all the sessions with Jane and, and doing the exercises with her. Completely cured. So did, did you do any exercise yourself or did you do any of the work for yourself? You can't go and try that. No, I don't think I don't think I did particularly. Um, I did do all of the tech you know, all of the quizzes. Because you you like quizzes, don't you? It's human nature. So I did do all of the quizzes. Um, but I don't think I did particularly many of the exercises. But just the logic of the thinking just made so much sense, and so it's a side effect. Two for the price of one. <laughs> she had to you a bill, yeah. yeah. <laughs> was, there, was, there, what would, was there any stumbling points? Was there, was there a part in it, or any parts in it where you thought, no, I just, that I don't believe, that can't be true, that's, that's got to be nonsense? <laughs> um, I don't think stumbling blocks in terms of thinking that anything within the book was nonsense. Um, there was a lot of, how can he know that? <laughs> in it. Or, you know, it's just how I feel. There was a lot of that. At the beginning, right at the beginning, there was, this will never work, how can a book help? Um, but that was right at the beginning. But nothing within the book um, did you find this can't, this doesn't make sense. Can, can I just ask, um, one of the things that I find most difficult with clients is helping them to overcome an obsessive thinking style. And I'm kind of assuming that would have been one of your main ones. Did you find that difficult to get over? And if you didn't, what did you find made the difference to do that? Um, yes, it was very obsessive, I suppose, because my whole life revolved around it. Um, it was to Alison, if I'm honest. It was her approach to everything and how she made me feel. She made me feel so much better about myself. And she seemed to understand everything I said to her. And if I had had a bad week or I went back to something that had worried me a lot in the past, Alison would just talk to me about it in a very understanding way and, and get me over it. I don't know how she did it. You have to ask Alison that one. Marvelous. She's marvellous, absolutely marvellous. Um, she's so understanding, you know, about my past and, and everything. And I know it's a job, so to speak, but it wasn't just a job. It was the way she came over to me 
we saw that bomb straight away, didn't we, Alison? And it, it was just all oh, down to Alison. I wouldn't have done it without her. I know what Maggie says. If I'd bought the book off the internet, I'd have read a few pages and thought, how's this going to cure me? No way is it, you know. But it was just the whole experience. I just got gradually better, week by week, more confident week by week. And till near the end, I just, I just knew I was cured. And within, I think it was four weeks of finishing with Alison, we went to Spain for a holiday. And I say I flew without any pills. And one night in the dining room, there's a little boy sat opposite me. And what did he do? He was sick all over the dining room table. I didn't like it, but I didn't run off like a screaming nutter or shout abuse or even let it really bother me. I just got up from the table and walked over to another table and sat down. And at that point, I really knew I was cured. Because you think you do, but until you actually see it or you're in a, a place where it's going to happen, you're never that 100% sure, but when that happened on holiday, I knew then that I was 100% cured. Your reaction to that little kid being sick, you do realise, is normal. None of us would like the kid being sick over yeah. the table. Yeah. You just had a normal reaction. Yeah, which I'd never had in my life before. Well. I never would have got to that stage before because I probably would have seen that that child didn't look well and I would have gone before it happened. But because I hadn't been scanning the room, um, because I was so relaxed and so confident now, I didn't see it coming. But I say I just got up from the table, went and sat on another table and carried on with my drink and everything was fine. Jane, how do you feel? Sorry, just further to Philip's question a minute ago. So yeah. Philip's question uh, was about uh, the obsessive thinking style. Yeah. And my previous question was really about that as well. Remember when I asked you, uh, was there any particular point or at what point? And, and if I may uh, try and answer Philip's question for Jane, um, when, a, when a person steadily goes through thrive from metaphobia, and uh, the locus of control is changed and the self-esteem is changed. I find, and I think that's what happened with Jane, we don't even need to hardly talk about the obsessive thinking style. I've shown you that graph that shows uh, a sense of competence on par with obsessing. As the person feels more competent, the obsessing just decreases. Yeah. So get, it, get the balance as you're going through it absolutely right. And you don't really need to focus much on obsessing. If we've got to the point with a metaphobe or anyone else who's, who's obsessive <coughs> and they're still obsessing a lot, they're obsessing that directly getting or trying to stop them obsessing isn't going to help that person. You need to be asking yourself, why are they obsessing? Right, the desire for control is obviously still very, very strong. Black and white thinking is still obviously very, very strong. And if those two things are strong, then the person's probably still being very external. Let's work on the externality being the cause, if you like, rather than the obsessing, which might be seen as the symptom of it. Yeah. Yeah. I'd ask every ex metaphobe now, and when we did the, the day in London uh, with, with Sarah, I said, what part of it? Was there a particular part? You know, which particular part of it? And they always say, with the metaphobe, there wasn't really a particular part. You know, I got better a little bit, and as I got better, my safety seeking and avoidance behaviors dropped a little bit. There wasn't a particular day or a eureka moment, as, as the competence and confidence increased, the safety seeking and avoidance behaviours just decreased. And it's as simple as that. If, if they're not, there's a bit missing somewhere, and it's almost always just the sense of self-efficacy, locus of control, self-esteem, yeah. along those lines. Any other questions? Yeah, um, it sounds like Alison did quite a bit of reframing as well. In the, um, it, and when you so so belief systems, it sounds were were targeted quite 
quite strongly, if it, uh, from what Jane was saying, it sounds like you were talking about things from your childhood and jumping over here and jumping over there, and, and you were making, um, you felt better, Jane, every time you spoke with, with Alison about yeah. those things. Oh, yeah, so that, it, what so, did you do, Ali? I think um, <coughs> with regard to experiences that Jane had had, um, say, over the past week or something, so they were bad experiences, we would talk through those, and I would, um, I would explain why she felt that way or how she would got to that point because of the way she was either viewing it through a shit in spectacles or thinking in a black and white way about it mm -hmm. and how that if she'd actually thought about it in this way it would have been a totally different experience. So, so that's how I dealt with her sort of recent experiences. Um, from memory, I think about her past, um, it was more just gaining perspective on it. Mm -hmm. I think, and, and trying to get her to understand potentially um, the situation her mother or whoever was in and why they, were, why they had perhaps said or done the things that they've done, whether they were right or wrong, but then just, just I think that perhaps just let Jane accept what had happened had happened, but there was no real need to keep brooding on it. Uh, and going over and over it because it really wasn't helping her. It was all about from today onwards. That's because it sounds like a, a, a obsessive thinking. Um, when you've reframed and you've got different perspective, you don't need to obsess over that particular thing anymore because yeah. you've changed your thinking. So you've dealt so, with it. So, <clears throat> you, so I mean, powering it up with the self esteem building and the internality and reframing, I think, has a very big. Mm. From what for, from this. Um, Situations that have a really big impact together. So, yeah, I, th I think the self-esteem exercise is absolutely key because that um, that naturally, from my experience, naturally reduces the brooding because it reduces the desire for control as well. Yeah, and that's why I tend to do it quite early on, particularly with metaphors and the really obsessive ones. And also, of course, as the self-esteem increases, so does self-efficacy and internality. I, I didn't deliberately leave the room, but I didn't hear what you said. But I'm guessing, in answer to the question, you know, uh, Jane made a couple of references to you to you making her feel better about her childhood. I'm going to go up the limb and guess that actually you didn't really talk much about her childhood, but that was Jane's experience of it. Because you made sense of everything she told you, you didn't particularly go I didn't back. talk a huge amount, but that I do remember discussing it a couple of times, yeah. and Jane bringing it up a couple of times. And you would make sense of it again. Yes, it was making sense of it and gaining perspective on it. So you didn't therapise, you didn't do CPI, for example, with her. You just made sense of it through the work you do in the book. Note to self-work. Any other questions?